You can start the outro off. Uh, how? However you want. Oh, tell me. No, you got it. Go. No, I don't know. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start it right here on the video. Otherwise. No, don't. I don't know what to say. Hello. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <sighs> Welcome to another unfiltered gamer review. Today we're gonna review Darkness Comes Rattling by Weird Games. It plays two to six players and takes roughly about an hour to an hour and a half and it's by Kevin Wilson. And in the game, Darkness Comes Rattling, we are playing as one of the tribes of man and our objective is to save the sun from the snake of darkness. A mother moon creates the sun, but in her uh, creation, she accidentally creates this snake that swallows the sun, and the snake is a, a bad guy. He's interested in jealousy and hatred, and he's attempting to eat this sun and put it into this, like, pit of his tail. And if he can get there, then basically the world is uh, plunged into twilight and darkness, and the shadows will corrupt everything. Uh, our objective is to go into the snake's mouth with one of us, uh, after achieving enough rewards, and take the sun back and pull it out of the snake's mouth and successfully defeat the snake and thusly ensuring the survival of man. Uh, it plays, like I said, the two to six players, a cooperative game, and we work together to go to the different areas of the world to achieve our goals. You ready to take a look at the game, explain how it's played, how we set it up, and then of course what we thought of the game. To set up the game, darkness comes rattling. The first thing you'll do is you'll take the game board out and place it in front of all players. Then you are going to take the four triangular pieces and place them in their quadrants. The Millennium Tortoise pieces will go in the northeast and the southwest quadrants, and the Bonesmith will go in the east, so southeast and the uh, northwest quadrants. You're then going to go ahead and take the dice and set it out next to all players and have each player select a character. That character will be represented by a human and a spirit they will get and they will set into bases, and you will place your human characters in the middle of the game board in the village. Each player will also receive a player board with their HP markers, as well as one of their player reference boards and the spirit marker on the side of their board. You're also then going to go ahead and shuffle all the decks, the east, west, south, and north decks, and make sure they're good and shuffled, the events deck, the shadow deck, the reward deck, and the legendary cards can be set aside along with their items, and finally shuffle the darkness deck. After that, you're going to go ahead and take out three cards for each of the quadrants, south, west, east, and north, and place them on the board in their proper positions. If the card says it's revealed, it's flipped face up. If it's not revealed, it goes face down. Uh, there are going to be corrupted cards as well, which I'll explain later in the game. Next, you're going to go ahead and take the wind boards and place them in their quadrants as well. There'll be a west, south, east, and north wind board. Make sure that you place them in their proper coordinates along with their marker and place that marker in the middle space, which is going to be represented by a zero. After you've done that, there are the different items you'll make sure they're separated by different types, as well as corruption markers, and you'll go ahead and take those little triangle pieces and place them in the darkness comes rattling game bag so that you do not know which markers are in the bag when you pull them out. After that, the game is ready to begin and the game is set up. Okay, so the game is basically set up. And the last thing is you just have to take this sun marker and place it on the head of the snake because what's gonna happen is the snake will eat this thing and if it gets to the very end of the board, then the game is over and you lose. There's three phases in the game, darkness comes rattling. And the first phase is the dawn phase, which Alicia will explain. So in the dawn phase, you'll have four action points and you can move, you can scout and you can trade, or you can remove a corruption. Yep. Uh, the first thing is movement, and how does movement work? You just move one space. And you can move um, up, down, left, or right. So if you're in the village, you can go any uh, to any of the middle areas on the board here. You'll land on the cards. And in addition, when you get to these spaces here, you can also move uh, left and right, which will also be a movement. So for instance, one, two, three, and four. That would be using all my action points, and they would all be used for movement. And uh, remember, you can land on these Bonesmith and Millennium Tortoise spaces as well. And then we have the challenge phase, where each character is going to resolve a challenge provided that they are on one. So for instance, in this phase, if all these players were in positions that were on a challenge, you would reveal those cards if they're not already revealed, and then players would attempt the challenge. They would take all the dice, including the black one, they would roll the dice, add up any modifiers they have, 
and or rerolls and check to see if their number is equal to or higher than the number on the challenge card, which in this case would be 11. And if they successfully accomplish that card, they would get a reward. Otherwise, they would take a failure. And failures are negative consequences, rewards are positive ones. You'll discard the card and the space will then be empty until the uh, end of the round. And each player will get to do this. Just like in the day dawn phase where each player will get a chance to move, you can select any player in any order. And the same is said for the challenge phase as well. Just go to one of the spaces, perform the action uh, by attempting the challenge, rolling the dice and hopefully succeeding using any weapon that you may want to use. And of course, any items as well. And you're always rolling this black die. In addition, regardless of whether you are on a challenge space or whether you're on the village or maybe this tortoise here, you have to roll this black die. And what does this guy do here? That one, when you roll it, it affects the sun, where the sun goes. Yeah, or... so there's the rattling ones, right? Which are gonna be one or two, and that will move the sun one or two spaces. And if the sun ever hits one of these spaces with a symbol on it, you'll perform the negative action or maybe positive one on the board that will affect the game in some way. Uh, then you got uh, this little eyeball here. What does this one do? A corruption token. Yeah, so then you'll add a corruption token to your region. And you could choose any of the three spaces on the region because these are regions and then each of these regions have three spaces. Uh, there's also a little shadow symbol here as well. In that one, you will add a corruption token adjacent to a shadow card. Yep. And is it also any, and also any adjacent in any corrupted spaces? So in this case, you'd be whenever you had corruption, you pull this through this bag, you place it on the spaces it tells you to. In this case, it would be on the corrupted spaces, which is that one there, uh, that one there, and then these two here. And you could place them actually on the space itself, just like that. Additionally, um, shadows. If there was a shadow on the board, like for instance, if this guy existed and was uh, I don't know right here you would add corruption to the adjacent spaces, which we would be any of the challenge cards and in addition, any of the spaces that have a merchant or a tortoise. When three corruption tokens go onto the board and aren't removed by the end of the round, what happens? It turns into shadow? Yes, it turns into a shadow card. And you'll be taking this card, you'll be removing it, you'll be adding a shadow to the space. Additionally, if it actually is going to be on one of these tortoises or on the bonesmith, instead of turning it into a shadow card, you'll flip this over and for the rest of the game, you're gonna to have to deal with the blind woman as opposed to the Millennium Tortoise, which still provides benefits for you, but however, is going to be more costly in order for you to be able to gain them. And that's basically how the challenge phase works. Uh, rolling this die, moving the sun, taking any negative effects. And if there is no effect that actually is present due to there being no shadow or corrupted spaces, the die doesn't do anything at all. Finally, there is the dusk phase. And how does the dusk phase work? In the dusk phase, you'll put cards on any empty spaces in the regions. And then all spirits will heal one wound. And if a region has three shadows, the, you'll anger the wind. Yeah. When you anger the wind, you'll just move the marker um, counterclockwise, I think. Yes, counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. And that will affect the board in some way. It's going to be a negative aspect. Um, in addition to placing the pieces down here, it also said that you're going to heal a wound for all spirits. Well, what are spirits, right? Spirits are the back of your character board. Uh, you do not want to be a spirit. <laughs> when you start off, you are a human. If you lose all your HP, you will flip over to being a spirit. Spirits, when it's your turn, that you can only move with them. You may not do any of the other actions. And additionally, you cannot complete challenge cards unless your spirit says otherwise. But at the end of every turn, you'll get a health. And once you get all your health back, your character will revive and you'll become human once again. And that's basically the gameplay. You're gonna go through those three phases and you fill up the board and, roll, and do anything with the spirits and or the wind and then it goes back to the dawn phase. Eventually what's gonna happen though is uh, there's gonna be a, a certain trigger for the game to uh, have you succeed or fail. Uh, there are three ways to lose the game. One is if the sun reaches the tail uh, another way is if all of the wins uh, get removed from the board because once they go to their lowest negative side, if they go any farther, they get removed. And I believe uh, the other way is if your character who's on the outside of the board dies. Well, do you know how the character works when you're going out on the outside of the board? Uh, so once the sun gets to this symbol right here, you can bring a character to the head of the snake. Yeah. 
Um, this character can move four and will also move if um, the characters on the board win a challenge. And this character is trying to achieve the sun, or, or retrieve the sun. It functions just like any other player on the board here, but it, it's going to be using all of its actions to move. If it moves onto a space with a symbol, it's going to suffer the effects. But if it moves onto a space with a symbol, uh, after comp somebody completes a challenge card because it gets plus one movement, it will not. Then, just like in the, after the dawn phase where the players all move, the challenge phase will happen. These guys will do cards out here, but this player here will do darkness cards. They're going to draw two of these cards, pick one of them, and then attempt to complete that challenge by rolling the dice just in the same way. And if they're successful, they'll achieve the bonus. If they're not, they will basically achieve the failure. And if the character dies, they're out of the game. The only way this character wins, along with everybody else, is if this character gets to the sun. In which the case, there's gonna be one thing that happens. Do you remember what happens? You have to defeat a darkness card. Yes, at a plus two difficulty. You can't draw two and pick one, you just get one. You're going to then add the difficulty, uh, 14, plus two, making this a 16, and then you can use any benefits and any other cards that you might have. If you can defeat this card, everybody wins. You achieve the sun, and you pull out of the snake's mouth, and you bring it back to the world of man. The snake dies, and we achieve victory. Pretty straightforward, uh, mostly. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about Darkness Comes Rattling, what we liked about the game, the different categories that we'll go through and what we didn't like about the game. Uh, we'll first start with theme, the theme of the game. You, uh, Mother Moon has presented the sun, the snake eats the sun, and all of men's best warriors go out, uh, stop the corruption, stop the darkness. Then one warrior who feels strong enough at a certain point in time, which is mid game to late game, because you can choose kind of when you bring your warrior into the snake, will go in and go through the snake's belly and try and get that sun and pull it back out before the sun is fully digested. I love that theme. Uh, that theme really worked for this game in my opinion. It felt like we were going around completing corruption, working together uh, to selectively defeat certain uh, pieces of corruption because your character can only remove the corruption of their color, unless some unique benefit provides you in the game. A torch. Yes, exactly. And uh, you're, you're just all meant to achieve that one objective. But only one of you can go in, and you're always going to send, like, Earth's best warrior. And they need a specific spirit weapon and other items to succeed. Without a weapon, you're basically going to lose the game, because if you die in this area, you're out. And then you have the winds that work together uh, in either tandem with you or against you. So if you anger the winds, you might have to go uh, back one. And if you successfully make them happy, you'll go up one because you have different spaces on the board. One is the bonesmith, which is Alicia's favorite space. <laughs> I liked getting all of my weapons. <laughs> I really like those weapons. I collected like four of them probably. Yeah, I mean, you go to the bonesmith, you turn in a bone, and you get any weapons you want, any items you want. You can only use one weapon at a time for each of the challenges, but you can use all the items. And the items present you with modifiers throughout the game on the different cards. And so gathering a whole bunch of them will help you not only in the darkness track outside the board, but also inside the board as well. And so it just feels like you're going to the merchant to get, get the items to help to remove the corruption, or you're moving to the tortoise to try and um, make the winds not angry. You feed the tortoise a bone, and you can push the wind up one space, thusly making the wind happy in that specific region. Um, <laughs> there's also event cards that work with the theme as well. You'll draw an event card. What, what, the first event card we got was terrible, but yeah. it would have been good if we got it late game. We drew it, we angered the west wind, where she's like, I'm gonna, well, she's angry. She's like, oh, I'm going to help you guys by removing all the shadow and all the corruption from the board, but it's going to be at great cost. I'm going to I'm gonna disappear, and every other wind is going to be mad because I did this. And so he did this early game. There was no shadows on the board. There was almost no corruption, and we lost our wind, and then all the rest of the winds were angered, and thusly we suffered negative effects for it. And so the theming came out really well in this game. I really personally love the theming for this game. Mm -hmm. um, quality of the game. What do you think about the quality of this game? It's really good. I really like um, the board and the art. Um, yeah, the quality looks really good. Yeah, I, I think the colors are vivid. It's easy to tell where things go, what things are. 
Cards are nice, board quality, thickness, everything about this game works great. I've noticed the one thing is these cards, our first game to play this, this game, sadly the cards were all like smooshy. Maybe that's my fault. I don't know, but like they're like like a xylophone. <laughs> only two of the three, only two of the four decks though did this. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a book and place them on here. But otherwise, excellent. Even the little bag here is nice quality canvas bag. And it's got the little name of the game. I wish mm -hmm. we did this for Moonshell. And the dice is even an etched die and then three different colored die, which is needed. Um, the one thing I would have liked, obviously, is minis. I wish they had little miniature, plastic miniatures as opposed to these guys here. And also, the stands here, when you attach them, you'll notice that it makes little cuts mm -hmm. in the piece, which makes me sad because the piece is going to be a little damaged. So I might 3D print myself some characters. I know at least I will do that for the spirits because I have little 3D print models for these things, which will be not part of this game at all, but something to deluxify my copy. <laughs> I mean, yes, quality overall is uh, is good. I would say it'd be in the, the good to great range. Not great, though, because there's just little baby issues I had with it. Uh, gameplay. What do you think about the, the way the game plays? Did you like the cooperative aspect? Did you like how you had to move it on the board? That kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I loved um, how it was cooperative. Um, I think that made it really fun. A lot of games that are cooperative, people do not like playing because it's what happens is one player becomes the alpha gamer and tells everybody what to do in this game. Does, that game su does this game suffer from that? No. I think we all were able to make our own decisions. I think what's also nice about this game, too, is... If you want, if your character passes on to the spirit realm, there is a specific module or like a variant where you mm -hmm. cannot speak as a spirit, but you move around the board and participate in the game until you become a human where you can start to talk again. Yeah, I didn't notice a big alpha gamer problem. Didn't feel like there was only one choice to make. It felt like you had a lot of options and players had a lot of autonomy in this game, which was very, very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, the phases were easy to understand uh, as far as how movement worked and how the characters interact with each other and corruption worked. One thing I will say is the rule book. The rule book needs work. I went through it a bunch of times, and each time I went through it, I figured out what sentence I needed to understand the rules. Like, oh, does my character, when he's in the space here, does he, when he steps on the space here, does he uh, suffer the effect? Because in any other case, he doesn't. Whenever you accomplish a goal or a card, he won't, but when he moves, he does, in fact. So be aware of that. And it's in the rule book, but it's only in one sentence. So it was kind of almost hard to miss, oh, hard, hard to not miss. Mm -hmm. um, another thing too is movement on the game board. It never specifies how you move. I wish there was an example, so I'm gonna tell you now. When you move four spaces, one, two, three, four. And you can go five, six, seven, all the way around the board and you follow the arrows. And the spaces are, are labeled basically here. You can walk on the cards, I guess, but I think it's, there's a little space present where you can walk the, on those spaces. And it would've been nice to have an example mm -hmm. because at first I wasn't like, I, was, I didn't know. I'm like, oh, is this little space here a space? Yeah, and then are these outside space? spaces? Uh, what is this? Are, are this, is this yeah. I'm, I'm like, oh, this is actually where you place the corruption. That's where you put the corruption for these spaces. But uh, that's not where you move. You move on these. Mm -hmm. But you do move on these. Mm -hmm. So it was like, oh, okay, like just little things like that. But once you play, as I played it, I, I understood what made sense. And now hopefully for you, it won't be too complicated. It's literally mm -hmm. spaces all the way around the board and one space in the middle, provided you're on the middle uh, card section. And the spaces are on the outskirts and in the middle, but not on the sides. And they are on here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there you go. That's that was that. But otherwise, though, a pretty straightforward game. How the corruption works is simple. Oh, I didn't mention two corruption. When you get corruption, it has a number and a, and, and a color, which was also really cool. When you roll dice to accomplish a goal or a mission, if this was a red four, and on this mission here, which is an eleven of any color, um. I roll the dice and bam, I got, I don't know, a four, a five, and a six. Uh, this four, because there's a red corruption four on here, would cancel out to zero. So I would only get the benefits of these guys here. Because it's a multicolored challenge and my character is blue and there's a blue one here, I can reroll a die. So I'd reroll this four, I'd get a two and it would work. With more corruption makes more dice non-usable in challenges. And that's why you want to get rid of them with your character or if you have the torch, uh, you can choose any color uh, as opposed to just the color that your character is which is really nice. So a lot of little things in this game, a lot of little um, bits and pieces uh, that go with the mechanics of the game, which is very nice that they added this, this player board to explain a good chunk of it. Not everything, because it doesn't actually have your actions on the board. The four mm -hmm. actions for movement, trading, removing corruption with your color, and, and 
Scouting. Uh, scouting. You flip over the card so you can see what it is. Oh, and scouting too. If you flip over a card and it has a little scouting um, sentence on it, that will trigger something to happen, whether or not you face that challenge later Unless or not. Unless you have the travel pack. Yes, and all the items that work with that. Speaking of which, uh, just let's talk about overall. Items, I love the items. I love mm -hmm. gathering the different items. They're all useful. Uh, you can only have one weapon in a challenge, but you can take all the items you want that might benefit you in some type of way. The different challenges of the different west, coast, west south, east, west side, east side, they, they have a bunch of story on them, and then the simple challenges are made really present as to what you, uh, oh, this, if you work together with a person on this space, you get plus two to your roll. If you have a weapon, you get plus two. This is an 11 challenge, but if you're any color, you get a free one re-roll. There's the text. This is the what happens if you win, what happens if you lose. Very well explained. And then the type of card it is on the, is on the top, whether it's a corrupted card or a revealed card um, or a card card. Yeah, I really like that some of them were revealed. I'm like, yes. We don't have to scout those ones. <laughs> it's nice, yeah. Some cards you start off with knowing what they are, which makes the scouting ability more interesting. So you're not just having to spend a scout on every single action if you do not want to because some mm -hmm. cards are just available to you. Other challenges, I'm not just going to give you rewards all the time. Sometimes they'll remove challenges from the game board. Maybe you don't want them there anymore. Or they'll remove like a shadow from the game board or corruption from the game board or they'll heal you. But healing, healing is challenging too, which is mm -hmm. also kind of cool. You can heal whenever you begin your turn in the middle space. But ending your turn on a space where there's not a challenge means you can't accomplish a challenge. And it means you're just going to roll the black die, which is always going to be just a negative. But on spaces like this one or on the tortoises or the um, bone smiths, you'll gain items. You'll help the wind out, which will progress you later in the game. And of course, you'll be able to heal yourself, which there's not a whole lot of ways to do so. Yeah, you can please the south wind to get healing though yes if you start your that. turn there mm -hmm. and this south wind is happy with you you're going to score a plus one to your heal every time mm -hmm. you are there as opposed to if you were make her angry whenever you start your turn there you will lose a turn lose yeah. a health which is uh rough. but i like how you can't necessarily completely die every in this game if no. you become a spirit then you will only have to move during that time but then you'll keep healing until you become alive again and the way that works is also really cool i love the idea of the spirit because it lets you stay in the game without eliminating you but mm -hmm. it does not help you you're still gonna have to roll the nasty die it's still gonna affect players in a negative way it makes things worse overall but your character isn't useless and you will eventually come back and be able to be useful yeah, once again i like that i wish we could have played as the spirit at some point but maybe next time i don't want to play as the spirit because you'll I know, die i wanted to experience it but none of us died yeah uh, <laughs> i mean uh, the one other thing i'll say i guess the one negative thing I, I, aspect of the game is the setup matters uh, how what different random cards are placed out if you get a bunch of corrupted to begin with and then you roll the corrupted side you're going to start with a ton of corruption it's going to be a very challenging game um if you have a bunch of um revealed ones it's going to be a little easier with no corruption on the board and then if you have a mixture of like revealed and non-revealed there'll probably be some type of balanced game with maybe a few corruption so there's some luck as to what that starts out with but there's a lot of mitigation to it as mm -hmm. well uh, love the items, love the artwork, love the quality. Overall, just a really, really fun game. This is one of my favorite games from Weird and one of my favorite cooperative games in a long time. This is actually a game I'm going to easily keep in my collection. It's a game that is going to see play again because it has a two to six player variant. Uh, there's a ton of different variants in the game book as to how to make it more challenging or how to make it easier. Um, and it doesn't just feel like uh, Forbidden Island, which you haven't played before, but it's Pandemic, Forbidden Island, like all those same old, same type of games. This one has a little bit of a unique twist to it. Uh, you're not just going around trying to get rid of all the corruption. There's other things to do, and there's a huge thematic element that feels more present in this game than a lot of other games. I am giving this game a solid recommendation. It's my seal of approval. I like this game. I love the snake. I love the art. Yes, I'm a huge fan of this game. Uh, there's legendary items. Look, I didn't get to see these, but you can get these on certain quests in the different areas. And if you have these guys, they give you a huge benefit, but you're not always going to see them every game. Oh, yes, good, good. You? Yeah, it was a really good game. No, it was really good. This is a fun, <laughs> fun game. You're going to enjoy this game if you like cooperative games. The only way you won't like this game is if you're not a fan of cooperative games, because it still is a cooperative game. There still can be some alpha gaming involved in it. But yes, it... Take a look at Darkness Comes Rattling. 
Hello, thanks for watching another review by Unfiltered Gamer. If you like this video, check out the rest of our videos here on YouTube. Like, and what else do we do? Subscribe. Yeah, hit that subscribe button and the bell notification button right here. <laughs> As well as go ahead and check out our website. There's tons of blog posts, giveaway, Kickstarter lists, all that kind of stuff. It's all link in the description. If you want to pick up the game, Darkness Comes Rattling, there's also a link here as well. This is a super fun cooperative game. A uh, huge table presence as well. Uh, I don't think I got much else to say. Buy Moonshell, my wife's game. We got some copies left over if you like. It's on moonshellgame.com or unfilteredgames.com. An excellent game as well, but not cooperative. Mm. That's all I got for you. And as always, I look forward to, what do we do this time? Rattling. Rattling next time? Yeah, rattling, <laughs> rattling. with you next time. <laughs>